I think it's maybe important to take a wider view about Reformation. A lot of times when you hear talk of the Reformation, what people mostly have in mind are Calvin and Luther and the people associated with them, maybe Zwingli. But, you know, historians distinguish the magisterial Reformation from the Radical Reformation. And the Radical Reformation is important, too. There was this heavyweight historian named Williams, who was a Harvard scholar in the 20th century, and he wrote kind of the definitive book about this. It's called The Radical Reformation. The magisterial reformers, they ended up thinking that their churches had a teaching magisterium that could dictate doctrine. And the other ones that are called the radical reformers are usually called Anabaptists because they came to believe in believer's baptism, which a surprising number of people got killed about back in the 16th century. It was considered a treasonous thing to take the authority to baptize and to just baptize as a believer. So, you know, Luther and Calvin ended up persecuting the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists were kind of like the second wave of the Reformation. Um, and they were just more radical. They were more kind of Bible only and not as hierarchical and traditional as the, um, the magisterial reformers. I mean, another way to put it is Calvin and Luther were big time Augustinians. They were very influenced by Augustine and his theology of grace and predestination and things like this. And the radical reformers, not necessarily so much. Anyway, I think they're important because they wanted to reform more than Calvin and Luther did. And um, some of them, you know, actually, like you and I in recent times, some of them, because of the Bible, actually turned into Unitarians, people who think that the one God is the Father, and they don't think that the one God is the Trinity. Yes, I've got a, a little bit about that in my book, not much. My book, The Restitution of Jesus Christ, I tell in there about thousands of Anabaptists being put to death in the early years of the Reformation by both Catholics and sometimes Protestants. So the Anabaptists, in a sense, weren't a part of the Reformation, or at least they didn't adhere to what the, the uh, top reformers taught, like Lu Luther and Calvin. Well, Williams treats them kind of like a, se a separate branch of what's or a different part of the same movement. I mean, they're still rejecting Catholic authority, you know, they're rejecting the leadership of the bishops and the Pope. Yeah. They're choosing scripture whenever it clashes with later traditions, but they're just, they're just more radical, you know, like you said, if you read the history, it's, it's actually quite depressing because it's an endless parade of people being strangled, beaten, <laughs> hung, drowned, burned at the stake, you know, over some of these differences like belief in believer's baptism or, you know, what was considered terrible heresy about the Trinity by people like Calvin. If you think about it, as evangelicals, our official ideology is that we base everything on the Bible. But if you actually look at what a lot of evangelical theologians say and kind of how they operate, how they argue, how they reason, it's clear that for a lot of them, the unifying factor, the root of it really is Catholic tradition as expressed in the first, especially the first four ecumenical councils. In our view, they're not basing things actually on biblical teaching in many cases, but they're basing them on these creedal statements. So that Christ has two natures is expressed in the 451 council, and that Father and Son are one essence is expressed in the 325 council, and the Trinity, I think, is implied in the 381 council, and they just want to pound the table and say, these are the things that unite all Christians. These are the things that hold all Christians together. It's this small C Catholic tradition. Yeah, but you and I just think, well, that's not good. You know, why isn't the New Testament the unifying factor? Martin Luther was questioning some of these authority positions of his church. What you and I believe is that Martin Luther and other leading reformers should have continued that approach so that, you know, you look at this doctrine of the Trinity, this teaching by the church that Jesus is also God, uh, along with the Father and even the Holy Spirit, who they believe is a person, so that all three, Father, Son, and Spirit, are individuals but they are all three the one God, 
which is what church fathers changed in these ecumenical councils. So they changed, I believe, changed the true teaching of the Bible. And we need to continue this Reformation spirit and examine these things to see if they really are taught in Scripture. Yeah, I mean, any Protestant, any evangelical should be amening this, right? They should be, (laughs) well, of course you should check things by Scripture. But see, the thing is, Kermit, that Scripture teaches Trinity and that Jesus has two natures. And then, well, then we'd have to discuss all of these famous proof texts that people like to appeal to. And, you know, in our view, you have to look at the whole picture of the New Testament in its first century context And when you really do that carefully, a lot of these alleged proof texts kind of just melt away. They melt away under the sun of just careful historical reading. Uh, There are a lot of things to talk about here, but part of the problem, I think, is that when you read your NIV study Bible or your ESV study Bible, you have translations and a bunch of notes that just, you know, hand these interpretations right to you as if they're self-evident. So, for instance... I remember in the ESV study Bible, I looked up, I think it was in Mark or Luke, the scene where Jesus gets baptized, and then God says, this is my son, my beloved, and then the Holy Spirit in some way comes down on Jesus. And the note says, see, so here you have the three persons of the Trinity with clearly with one essence, one triune God, right? All in action in one scene. No, that's that's not what's there at all. <laughs> there wasn't anybody in the first century thinking about it that way. It just would have never occurred to that author. But here it is, you know, in this heavy tome produced by dozens of scholars. And how can that not be right? Well, our official ideology is we base everything on scripture, but our actual practices, we base things on Catholic tradition as much as we can and we, we try to be as Catholic as possible, at least in those areas that people like Luther and Calvin agreed with. Um, we're just going to stick to the classical Catholic tradition. Here's an analogy. Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus gives the keys to the kingdom to Peter. Yes. And you've got a very interesting book about this. I'll put a link to that episode and to the book on the podcast episode. But of course, there's a Roman Catholic interpretation of all of that, which is Peter is the first pope, the first bishop of Rome. Peter, the first pope, is given this special authority as the head over the church under Christ. There's a Catholic kind of spin on this, right? Yes. Imagine that every study Bible, every commentary you could actually get your hands on every translation just totally reflected that Catholic reading. And so you, the ordinary believer, would just look at that and say, well, that's just what it says. You know, it just says that Peter has this highest authority over the church because he's the first pope. And look, Jesus made him the first pope. So, like, how could anybody not think that? (laughs) Of course, there have been times and places where you'd have exactly what I just said. You know, if you're in the Middle Ages and um, your only commentary is written in Latin by a Roman Catholic, then, so to speak, all the authorities, all the authoritative voices that you're hearing are telling you that it says that. But they're wrong. We would, would have a hard time untangling that if every expert we looked at gave the classical Catholic interpretation. But we've got something similar with the Trinity, because Protestant tradition, mainstream Protestant tradition, has evolved to just completely, purely exclude any argument, any discussion on this topic. If someone wants to say, well, wait a second, is there really a triune God in the Bible? What are you, a Jehovah's Witness? What are you, some kind of crazy cultist? Of course, Plenty of heavyweight Bible scholars will tell you that there is no idea of a triune God in the New Testament. People like the Roman Catholic Hans Kung, for instance, will tell you this. We've evolved this tradition where it just prohibits certain questions from being asked. Okay, but then we're in, the ordinary person is in kind of a helpless situation because they might think something's fishy, something's up. They've heard that not all Protestants are Trinitarians. But when they go to look at it in their study Bible or in their commentary, they're getting Trinitarian commentary. Yeah, so there's, there's a kind of embargo against considering opposing arguments. 
which is really strange if you think about it. If it's a slam dunk case, you should just gladly debate all comers, right? Bring it on. Yeah. Think the Trinity's not in the Bible? Well, let's hear it, man. Go ahead. I'll give you half an hour. Go. I'll give you 20 pages. Go. Let's see the case that the Trinity's not in the Bible. Yeah, I wish they would do it in my case, but I'm never allowed. I think the church has made a big mistake, and it goes way back in history, of not allowing dissent and not listening to what the other person has to say. And so I don't have any way to be able to express myself on what I think the Bible teaches on this. And I have actually challenged some evangelical leaders about this to debate, and they refuse to do it. I think that's an unaccountability. If their case is so strong, they should entertain the idea. Right. I mean, a strong case, when it's compared to a weak case, just makes the strong case look better. Yes. It's like um, if you put a pretty person next to an ugly person, it just makes the pretty person all the better looking. It's not going to take them down in any way because they're standing next to somebody that's ugly. Um, <laughs> it's, right. So... Why aren't Kermit Zarley and Dale Tuggy being hauled in to be debated constantly so we can show everybody how their cases just easily amounts to nothing or can easily be refuted? Yeah. It's a little maybe telling. I think some of the better scholars among Trinitarians realizes that the case is actually very speculative and very tenuous. You have leading New Testament scholars nowadays who say, well... The doctrine of the Trinity is not really taught expressly in the New Testament, but they think that church fathers in the following centuries concluded correctly that the uh, doctrine of the Trinity is in the Bible in an embryonic form. It just needs to be brought out. And you have leading scholars like Tom Wright and Jimmy Dunn, Larry Otada, Richard Bauckham, all kinds of them who teach this. And it's called uh, developmental Christology. And I don't think it makes sense. I don't think it adheres to what Jude teaches there when he says, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to you. Some of the most careful Bible scholars and historians and sometimes theologians some of them say, actually, no, it's, it's not obviously implied there because, you know, it did take quite a while to develop, and that doesn't seem likely if it really is obviously implied there. It would have been obvious from the start. So they fall back to another position, which is, okay, what we're really saying is the Trinity is the best explanation of what Scripture says and doesn't say. It's the best explanation. Okay, but there's always multiple explanations of, of, of an observed phenomenon, right? Yeah. Why did this guy get sick? Well, maybe because he ate the guacamole, maybe because he uh, didn't wash his hands after going to the bathroom, maybe this guy got sick because uh, someone coughed on him. There could be multiple explanations, and we try to figure out which one is overall the best, which one we should accept. Okay, so if we're talking about the New Testament... One explanation of everything that's there is really there's a triune God that's inspiring all this, and that's why all these things are said. Of course, we have an alternate explanation of all of these passages. We don't dismiss things that we can understand. We don't cut apart our Bible like Thomas Jefferson. We try to understand them in a first century context, and so, you know, we make points like a being can be called God and not be the one true God, which was taught to us by Jesus in John chapter 10 <laughs> in an often overlooked passage. But anyway, we have an explanation of these passages. We Unitarian, we non-Trinitarian Christians have explanations of these passages and the Trinitarians, let's pretend they have one explanation and not a bunch. Okay, but to find the best explanation, you would need to carefully consider the rival explanations. That's exactly what they're refusing to do. Yes. They don't want to hear the other point of view because we already know we're right. And there's some real pride involved, I think, that it would just be too embarrassing, you know, for our group, for our identity, 
if some of these Trinity speculations turned out to not be right. And so they just got to be right. I mean, we're going to get angry if someone suggests that maybe that's a mistake. We want to go by what James says. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's what we don't do on the topic of the Trinity. We get mad really fast, call a person a heretic, slander them as hating scripture, cutting up scripture, thinking they know everything, refusing to believe what they can't explain, all these old slanders, and not actually like hearing what the person has to say. I was trained as a philosopher, and you know, say one philosopher believes in free will and another one doesn't believe in free will. Say I do believe in free will. I don't only read the free will guys. That would be crazy. If I'm interested in the truth of the matter, I'm not going to just only pay attention to the people that already agree with me. I'm going to read people that agree with me, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time exploring other positions and seeing if they are overall better positions. So it's always struck me as really strange how present-day academic theology and present-day evangelical academic theology, it struck me as strange that they do not want to have an argument about these things because they should want to, if indeed these things are so obvious. Yeah, I've seen many times people teach the Bible, teach some particular theology from the Bible, and they only cite those biblical texts that seem to support their position, and they ignore the many other biblical texts that seem to refute their position. Yeah, I mean, it's very strange. I mean, imagine that you're a juror in a trial, like a criminal murder trial. If the attorney for the other side gets up and presents only a portion of the evidence and it totally makes their case look obvious, well, that's, that's kind of dishonest, right? You should, you should demand that, that this attorney can account for all the evidence, not just the little bits that are favorite to him. Maybe they found the guy's fingerprints on the gun, but then the, the guy also has an airtight alibi and someone stole his gun. So if you're just going to stick to the fingerprints part, it's going to sound like a slam dunk guilty verdict. That's not what the wise juror does. Wise juror wants to hear it all. You know, that takes some patience and some willingness to study, I think, that not everybody has. But if we're not willing to do that, we're just going to be a victim to hearing only one side. There's a proverb that says, the side that gets up to speak first in court always sounds right until the cross-examination begins. (laughs) 